for those of you who are visiting with us this morning, we have been studying the book of Philippians together for the past few months. And we have subtitled our study in this glorious letter from the Apostle Paul, The Gospel-Driven Life. The Gospel-Driven Life. And we've chosen that title on the basis of this letter's thesis verse, Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, which says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. All of the exhortations and instructions that Paul will give throughout the remainder of this letter are simply the exposition of this command. And so the book of Philippians is a call to live life worthy of the gospel, or as we've put it, to live a gospel-driven life. All of Paul's concerns for his dear friends at Philippi, all of his desires for their growth in grace are summed up by this overarching concern to bring the gospel of Christ to bear on every aspect of their lives. Paul's aim his chief desire is that the people of God would live in a manner that is consistent with the implications of what Jesus Christ has accomplished on their behalf, that every facet of their lives would be shaped and driven by the gospel that they had come to trust and treasure. And in these closing verses of chapter 1, Paul gives them three specific applications of the command to live worthy of the gospel. Three specific applications in view of their present circumstances. And we've studied those applications in depth. In verse 27, he emphasizes their need to stand firm in the face of opposition. To hold their ground amidst attacks and amidst temptations to compromise. He also exhorts them in verse 27 to go on striving together for the gospel. Not just to have a good defense against external attacks, but to offensively go on proclaiming this gospel in the midst of a hostile society. And he charges them in verse 28 to be fearless in the midst of that mission, trusting entirely in the sovereign Lord who is not only with them in their trials, but sovereignly ordains their suffering for Christ's sake as a gift of divine grace. And in our study of those texts, we've considered the applications that such exhortations have for us in our own context, how we also must be marked by steadfastness, by aggressiveness, and by courage as we carry out our mission to take the gospel of Christ to our communities. And we've also noted Paul's emphasis on unity amidst this opposition. He calls them not merely to stand firm, Stop, but stand firm in one spirit, not merely to strive for the faith of the gospel, but with one mind to strive together for the faith of the gospel. And as we come into chapter 2, we discover afresh that unity is the apostle's great concern. In these opening verses of chapter 2, Paul appeals to his dear friends at the church of Philippi to make his joy complete by being unified. Now, we mentioned last time that I was with you that this unity that the Apostle Paul is calling for is not a doctrinal unity. Now, it's not because Paul doesn't care about doctrine. Nothing could be further from the truth than that. It's just that this wasn't the problem. The Philippians weren't arguing with each other about the gospel. They're not debating fundamental matters of truth. Paul consistently praises the Philippian church as a sound church, as being solidly grounded and partners in the gospel. If doctrinal disunity was the problem, we'd sure be able to tell by the themes that Paul raises in the letter. But there isn't a hint of doctrinal reproof or any confrontation of error within the church, except maybe to warn them of potential dangers out, that are potentially coming from outside the congregation. So the Philippians could all sign the same doctrinal statement. The disunity that they were experiencing was relational. It had to do with something as practical and as mundane as the way that they were getting along with one another. They weren't having doctrinal disputes. There were just some things about each other, you know, personal preferences, opinions on secondary matters, personality clashes that just got on each other's nerves. And this was being manifested particularly in a disagreement between two of the leading women of the church which Paul writes about in chapter 4, verse 2, when he says, I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Literally, to be of the same mind in the Lord. You see, if the Philippians were going to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, by steadfastly withstanding opposition, by aggressively proclaiming the gospel behind enemy lines, and by being fearless in the midst of the suffering that would result of it, 
They were going to have to be unified. The kind of petty grumbling and personal bickering with one another that was going on would only dull their witness and cripple their ability to strive together for the faith of the gospel. And so it's in that context of opposition that Paul issues a clarion call to Christian unity in the opening verses of Philippians chapter 2. Let's read chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 4. Paul writes, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And as I introduced to you last time, there are three components to this call to Christian unity. There is the motivation, there is the matter, and there is the means of Christian unity. Why we are to be unified? what specifically Christian unity consists in, is marked by, and how we can go about pursuing it in our own practical living. The motivation, the matter, and the means. And we spent our time last time looking at those first two, the, both the motivation and the matter of Christian unity. And so the focus of our message this morning will be on that third component, the means. But before we jump right back in, I wanted to spend some time to briefly review those first two components just so that we capture the flow of Paul's thought as he, guided by the Holy Spirit of God, intended for us to understand. So first, we considered the motivation for Christian unity in verse 1. How does the Apostle Paul seek to motivate the Philippians toward obedience? Does he simply chide them, tell them to grow up and get their act together? Does he shame them? By calling their salvation into question? As if to say, you mean to call yourselves Christian and this is how you behave with one another? No. What he does is to call their minds to the gracious blessings that they have received and experienced as a result of their union with Christ. He reminds them who they are by virtue of the gospel and shows them that the only fitting response for a people who have been so blessed and so graced is to walk in unity with one another. Listen to that gospel-driven motivation in verse 1. Paul writes, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. This is a loving, tender, pastoral appeal for them to be reminded of their identity in Christ and to let the experience of those gracious blessings that are theirs in the gospel be the fuel for their fight to, for unity. And he stirs them up by using these if statements that he knows to be true of them. It's like asking rhetorical questions that he knows the answer to. He asks in the first place, have you experienced the encouragement or better rendered the comfort of the Lord Jesus, as he has attended to you in the, in the midst of your suffering for his sake? Do you have any experience of that? In the times when you have had to bear the reproach of the gospel from the mocking and the slander of an unbelieving and perverse generation, haven't you known the comfort of Christ's own fellowship in those times? Paul says, I know you have. I know you have. And then, is there any consolation of love? And we mentioned last time that that's best understood as the Father's love for his people. Paul's asking us, do you know the tenderness of your Father's love? Have you experienced your Heavenly Father coming alongside you and as it were speaking sweet words of consolation and love to you? Oh, I know that you have, Philippians. I know that you have. And is there any fellowship of the Spirit? Haven't you all been made sharers in the one Spirit of God? Haven't you all been made to drink of the same Holy Spirit? Haven't you all been baptized by that Spirit into the unified body of Christ? Well then, Ephesians 4.3, be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And finally, if there's any affection and compassion, 
If your experience of God's tender mercy and compassion have had any effect on you at all, so as to produce in you that same kind of loving affection that bears fruit in deeds of compassion, well then make my joy complete by being unified. And so we saw that the Christian's motivation to unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ comes from the grace that is ours in the gospel and in our experience of those blessings as they are ours in Christ. And then we observe the matter of Christian unity itself. What is Christian unity to be marked by? We know the why. Now we need to understand the what. And Paul uses, as we said, four expressions in verse 2 that make up the content of his call to unity. Read verse 2 with me. He says, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. To be of the same mind is to be united in thought, in disposition, and in attitude. The ground floor of Christian unity is the unity of the mind. Any notion of Christian unity that is a a mushy sentimentalism, that overlooks substantive differences in favor of a superficial togetherness, is foreign to the pages of Scripture. We are, first of all, to be of the same mind. But it goes beyond the intellectual. Christian unity most certainly is not less than intellectual and attitudinal agreement, but it is so much more. We are not only to be of the same mind, but to maintain the same love, Paul says. So unity is not merely a matter of the head. It's a matter also of the heart. We're not only to agree with one another, we're to love one another fervently and from the heart, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. And Paul doesn't even stop there. Not only are we to be of the same mind and maintain the same love, we must also be united in spirit. Literally, together in soul. You see, Christian unity that's driven by the gospel of Christ, it reaches the mind, the same attitude and the same disposition. It reaches the heart, maintaining the same love. But it also reaches our very soul, this phrase teaches us. The whole animating principle of a person. We're called to cultivate the kind of unity with one another such that our hearts beat together that our lives are driven by the same overriding passion and ambition. And that brings us directly to the final phrase. We are to be intent on one purpose, directed by a single focus. And what is that single focus? Of course, it is the gospel of Christ. This is what it means to be gospel-driven. The realities and the blessings that we experience by our participation in the gospel, as well as our commission to minister that gospel to the world, both of those things are to shape our conduct in our relationships with one another. That's to be brought to bear on how we interact with one another. The disunity that comes from these kinds of personal disagreements it weakens our effectiveness and our common mission to proclaim the gospel of Christ's lordship to a world that is hostile and opposed to him. So we are not to let this kind of discord stand in the way of the one purpose, Paul says, of making disciples of all nations by proclaiming the forgiveness of sins in Christ. So then, this is our extended review, and that has taught us, hopefully, for those of you who haven't been with us throughout those messages that the motivation for Christian unity is the gospel and the gracious blessings that are ours in Christ. And we have learned that the matter of Christian unity consists in Paul's fourfold call to be united in mind, in heart, in soul, and in purpose. But now, this morning, we come to the means of Christian unity. Our Lord, through the inspired pen of the Apostle Paul, has commanded us to pursue a unity with our brothers and sisters that is driven by the gospel. But the question we've got to answer now is, how? How do we attain to that kind of unity? How do I go about pursuing that kind of unity with my brothers and sisters? Paul answers that question in verses 3 and 4. The means of Christian unity is a humility that manifests itself in helpfulness. We are pursuing unity. We pursue unity by being humble, and that humility will issue in 
being helpful. Let's read verses 3 and 4 together. Paul says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So follow this progression with me. The overarching concern for the Apostle Paul is that the Philippians be driven by the gospel. Chapter 1, verse 27. And the way that that will manifest itself in their particular context is by their standing firm in the face of opposition and continuing to be an effective witness in their communities for the gospel, even amidst such hostility. But that steadfastness and effective witness will not be achieved without unity. If they're all fighting together, they're never going to be able to advance with the same pace, with a united front. And here we learn that that unity that is so necessary will not be achieved without humility. The key to experiencing the kind of gospel-driven unity that Paul calls us to in verse 2 is to be characterized by the kind of gospel-driven humility that he outlines for us in verses 3 and 4. And he does so by means of two contrasts. We call them not but contrasts. The verses are structured by telling us what we are not to do on the one hand and then followed by the contrast of what we are to do on the other. So he says, verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Verse 4, do not merely look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. And so our pursuit of gospel-driven humility has both these negative and positive aspects to it. And we'll outline it that way. Look at these two contrasts. And in each contrast, look at the negative and the positive. So let's look at that first contrast in verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. John Calvin has called these twin vices, selfishness and empty conceit, two most dangerous pests for disturbing the peace of the church. The word translated selfishness here is the Greek word eretheia, and we've seen this word before. It shows up back in chapter 1, verses 17, to describe the rival preachers in Rome who, it says, proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause Paul distress in his imprisonment. And that's a good translation of the word, selfish ambition. It speaks of a zealous lust for prominence and recognition that issues in self-serving, self-promotion, no matter what the cost is to others. The word was used of career professionals who ruthlessly tried to climb to the top of their fields of business in any way they could, and also of politicians who sought to attain political office at any expense. This was a perfect word to describe those rival preachers who sought to rise to prominence on the preaching circuit by taking advantage of the fact that Paul was laid up in prison. And think about what the Philippians would have thought when they heard this. Could you imagine the antipathy that the Philippians would have for the preachers who proclaimed Christ out of rivalry and evil intent toward Paul? As much as this dear church loved Paul, as zealous as they were for his welfare, even to send Epaphroditus on a 40-day journey where he almost died to make sure that they could minister to Paul's need, I think it would have been difficult for them to harbor anything but ill will against those who sought to distress their dear apostle. But imagine the shock when they hear that Paul is using this same word to caution them against some of their own behavior. Imagine what they must have felt when they read verse 3 and discovered that some of their own number were in danger of being just as selfishly ambitious as these rival preachers. The desire for recognition and prominence in the church is every bit as ugly as people preaching the gospel, not to glorify Christ, but in order to get famous and cause faithful ministers distress. In the following phrase, empty conceits, very similar translates the Greek compound word kenodoxia from kenos, which means empty, and doxa, which is glory. This is what the old translations uh, translated as vain glory. It's exactly what it sounds like. It is an inflated, exaggerated view of self that seeks glory and recognition because the person esteems himself better than he is. But in reality, that glory and that recognition that is so zealously sought after has no ground. No basis in reality. There is no basis for that kind of glory coming to that person. 
And so selfish ambition and vainglory, very related but subtly different. Pastor John, in his commentary, puts it this way. And for those of you visiting, I've found that you can't quote the senior pastor too much in your sermons. So you may hear Pastor John a little bit in these these, uh, coming words. Pastor John puts it this way. He says, Whereas selfish ambition pursues personal goals, empty conceit seeks personal glory and acclaim. The former pertains to personal accomplishments, the latter to an overinflated self-image. And oh, the damage that this can do to a local church. When professing Christians are marked by desire to be recognized as superior to each other, and unity doesn't stand a chance. Not a chance. If everyone is comparing with themselves with one another, trying to outperform one another, a spirit of bitterness and of rivalry will infect that church faster than the speed of light, and they will have no hope of standing together in one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. This kind of selfish ambition and empty conceit absolutely cripples a church's witness to the unbelieving world. And so it is no wonder that the Apostle James writes in James 3.16, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. And is there any sadder illustration of this than the infamy of Diotrephes, whom we learn about in the third epistle of the Apostle John? The Apostle John dubs Diotrephes as the one who loves to be first in the church. The older translations say who loves to have the preeminence among other Christians. He calls him literally in 3 John 1, 9, the first place loving Diotrephes. We speak of somebody as fun loving so-and-so. This was the first place loving Diotrephes. This man could tolerate no rival. His insights were to be regarded as the most profound. His abilities and his giftedness were to be hailed as the greatest among the flock. To the point that he became so puffed up with selfish ambition and vain glory that he became absolutely impervious to correction. And it always goes there. Impervious to correction. He wouldn't even receive instructions from the Apostle John. I mean, John who had walked with Christ himself. And anyone who dared disagree with him, he had had put out of the church. Verse 10. Disagreement with Diotrephes was ground for immediate excommunication. And dear friends, I ask you, Can unity exist in a church like that? Absolutely not. That partisan, factious spirit, that love of preeminence, chokes the life out of the gospel-driven unity that Paul calls us to faster than you could say, look at me. My friend, I plead with you, don't let this be you. Don't choke the life out of the unity of the church by lusting after prominence and recognition by refusing to receive correction and admonition, by always defending yourself, always insisting on your own way, don't conduct yourselves according to selfish ambition and vain glory. That glory that you seek, can I tell you something? That glory that you seek for yourself will never satisfy you. I know it promises satisfaction, and I know it feels good to be recognized and praised and patted on the back. But that pleasure is a counterfeit pleasure. It is, Ephesians 4, a lust of deceit. The glory of self will not satisfy your soul for eternity. You just haven't been designed that way. Human beings made in the image of God, by God, has, has not, they have not been designed. We have not been designed to thrive on the glory of self. We've been designed, praise God, to thrive on the glory of God. That's why why Paul can rejoice as he sits in prison, awaiting his potential execution, while other preachers who name the name of Christ are roaming free, slandering him in the process. Yes, and I will rejoice, Philippians 1, 19 and 20, because I know that I will not be put to shame in anything, but with all boldness, what? Paul will be exalted? Paul will be vindicated? No, no. I will rejoice because even now, as always, Christ will be magnified. The Christian is the one who delights in the glory and the magnification and the exaltation of Jesus Christ, not the glory and the exaltation of self. That's why Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, 
For we, speaking of the true followers of Jesus, are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Oh, friends, do nothing from selfishness and vain glory. How can you believe, John 5, 44, when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that is from the only God? No, instead, verse 3, with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. The antidote to selfish ambition and empty conceit and the key to true Christian unity is humility of mind. And the NAS gets it right on with that translation. The Greek word is tapenophrasune, from tapenos, which means low or, or small or humble, and phronema, which means mind or thinking. This is a lowliness of mind. Now, before the New Testament, this word, this notion of lowliness of mind was used exclusively as an insult in the Greek language. To be called someone who is lowly of mind kind of sort of meant that you were a few fries short of a happy meal. You know, you were sort of a dimwit. To the Greeks, humility connoted lowliness, weakness, lack of freedom, servility, and subjection. And the Greeks sought to elevate humanity to nobility through the employment of human reason. But it's only with the dawn of the New Testament, in the shadow of the glory of our self-denying Savior, that this concept becomes a virtue. And let's go to the passage in which Jesus turned this principle on his head. Turn to Matthew chapter 20. Jesus has just foretold his death and resurrection. And while he's speaking about mocking and scourging and crucifixion that would come, James and John, pretty much ignoring everything that, they, that Jesus is saying, making clear they haven't heard a word he said, they have a request to ask. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, tells us that they enlist the help of their mommy to ask Jesus to grant that they would sit, each of them, one on the right hand and one on the left hand in his kingdom. You see, they wanted to secure for themselves places of prominence. And when the disciples found out about it, verse 24, they became what? Indignant. Indignant with the two brothers. Now before James and John had made this request, there was ostensibly a unity and a harmony that existed among the disciples. But as soon as selfish ambition and vainglory reared their ugly heads, there was discord, there was strife, and disunity among the twelve. And how does Jesus respond? Verse 25. But Jesus called them to himself. Says, come here, come here, come here. You know. And said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. He says, you're all thinking like a bunch of pagans. You know that it's the Gentiles' way to lord it over those they rule. And to force themselves into positions of prominence. But, verse 26, it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. You want to be great? You want to have a position of prominence in the kingdom of God? Become a servant, a diakonos, a table waiter. You want to be first? Become a slave, doulos, no rights, owned. Verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And we could say in the language of Philippians 2, just as the Son of Man with humility of mind regarded others as more important than himself and looked not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, not counting equality with God a thing to be grasped, but taking the form of, of a servant, he emptied himself. And so in the Lord Jesus Christ, humility of mind becomes a virtue. And what does this humility of mind consist in? It consists in regarding one another, in counting one another as more important than ourselves. And this is a key concept in the pursuit of humility. If you go back to Philippians 2, a major focus in the pursuit of gospel-driven humility is the mind, the way that we think about ourselves and the way that we think about others. And the opening verses of Philippians 2 are just dripping with this emphasis on the mind. Let me read you a literal translation of verses 2 through 6. Paul says, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, minding the one thing. 
nothing according to selfish ambition or vainglory, but rather in lowliness of mind, regarding or counting or reckoning one another as more important than yourselves. Not paying attention, not minding merely your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this attitude among yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not regard or count or reckon equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. In these five verses, we have seven instances, seven times a word is used that speaks about thinking or the mind. Humility, the key to Christian unity, is fundamentally a matter of the mind. Now, it's not, a, it's not a false modesty. Humility is not a, a phony courtesy and self-deprecation that pretends to be humble and seeks to flatter others in an attempt to get people to like them. That's pride, dressed as humility, if anything. In his excellent book on humility, C.J. Mahaney captures the essence of humility with this short definition. He says, it's honestly assessing ourselves in the light of God's holiness in our sinfulness. Humility is honestly assessing ourselves in the light of God's holiness and our sinfulness. This is the opposite of vainglory, which we spoke about before. Vainglory, as we said, is an, an inflated view of self that makes us believe that we have reason to boast in ourselves. That's empty glory. But the Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, 3, For through the, great, the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has granted to each a measure of faith. We are to have an honest, sober assessment of ourselves. And in the light of God's holiness and our sinfulness, the only proper estimation of ourselves is one of lowliness and humility. In fact, that's why we call vain glory vain glory. Calvin writes, Vain glory means any glorying in the flesh. For what ground of glorying have men in themselves that is not vanity? You hear his reasoning there? Glorying in ourselves is empty because we have absolutely no good reason to boast in ourselves. Spurgeon called pride a groundless thing, a brainless thing, the maddest thing that can exist. And he's right. I can think of nothing more absurd, nothing more irrational, nothing more absolutely insane than a sinful human being like you, like me, a mere creature of the dust, boasting in the light of the white hot holiness of our Creator. That's ridiculous. It is this proper, sober self-assessment that keeps humility from just being just sort of a mind game, just sort of a game that we play in regarding one another as more important than ourselves. We're, we're not called to trick ourselves into believing that everybody else is better than us at everything in the world. No, it's, it's that when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, and then when I survey the darkness, the sluggishness of my own heart to do all that the Scriptures have said, believe all the Scriptures have said, the repeated failure, time after time, confession after confession, I don't care who I'm standing next to, I know the wickedness of my own heart, and that means in my eyes I am the worst sinner in the room. I love the way Pastor John puts this. It's just so helpful, so insightful. He says, think about it this way. You know more sin about your own heart than you do about anybody else's, right? So if we're talking just from the level of first-hand information, who is the worst sinner you have ever met? Who's got the most corrupt mind that you know of? That you know of? That's brilliant. The answer for every one of us in this room is me. Because none of us knows anyone else's heart. But oh, we know our own hearts, don't we? We know enough of our own hearts that we can honestly regard everyone else as superior to us. Each one of us knows enough of our own hearts to exclaim with integrity, along with the Apostle Paul, I am the chief of sinners. That's what Paul said about himself. He said that he was the least of all the apostles, not fit to be called an apostle, 1 Corinthians 15, 8 and 9. He said he was as one untimely born, that's not false humility. 
That's not a feigned modesty. That's a man who knew his own heart. Grace Life, do you know your own heart? Do you know your own heart? I'm telling you, I talk to some Christians, some professing Christians, even some professing Christians here at Grace Community Church, who just seem to have no acquaintance with their own sinfulness and with the absolute holiness of God. And I say this trembling, but I hope that it's helpful for you. Just people who are so impressed with themselves. And I pray that it's not one of you. People so quick to give others a hard time. People who are impervious to correction. Just unteachable. You got nothing to say to me. I've been here for 30 years. Listen to John MacArthur. I've read the MacArthur Study Bible with the notes. Who does he think he is correcting me? People who, can, who believe they can judge the motivations and intentions of people's hearts. I know that's what he said, but I, I know that he doesn't really mean it. So I'm not going to forgive because he doesn't really mean it. That is the maddest thing that can exist. That's like Spurgeon said. The maddest thing, craziest thing that can exist. And dear friends, don't let that be you. Be acquainted with yourselves well enough to know your own sinfulness and with, with a proper estimation of yourself in the light of God's holiness. In humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Well, that brings us to the second contrast, which is presented in verse 4. Follow along with me. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So we've said that the key to, pro to producing or to pursuing true Christian unity is humility. Well, verse 4 teaches us that that humility will issue in being helpful. Humility will issue in being helpful. And I choose my words carefully there when I say that humility will issue in being helpful. It's not so much that humility and helpfulness are these kind of parallel twin pillars standing side by side in this pursuit of unity. It's really that humility is the key to unity, but helpfulness, that disposition to consider the interests of others as a greater priority than your own, is the necessary expression of a humble heart. And the grammar of the original bears this out. The modern translations begin a new sentence in verse 4. But literally the verb, do not look out for your own interests, is not an imperative, it's a, a participle. And what that means is that the text literally reads, nothing from selfishness or vain conceit, but with humility of mind, regarding one another as more important than yourselves, not merely looking out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So verse 4, what that all means is that a verse, verse 4 is really an elaboration of verse 3. It tells us what this humility will be characterized by. It's kind of a way of putting some hands and feet on humility, of making humility tangible and concrete. Because of how central the mind is in humility, you might get the impression that all the Apostle Paul was, was after was a disposition or an attitude, that humility is just an abstract character quality. We might be tempted to think, well, sure, you know, I think of other people as more significant than myself, sure. I know my own heart. I understand my sinfulness in the light of God's holiness. Hey, I mean, as far as it goes, I've got this humility thing down. I'm glad you find that funny. <laughs> but because of that temptation, Paul says the Christian who is truly humble, tangibly, practically, and concretely puts other people's benefit, interests, ahead of his own. If Jesus defined true greatness as humility, then it is most certainly the case that the greatest among you will be your servant. So the humble Christian does not merely think a certain way about his brothers and sisters. His humility of mind issues in or manifests itself in being a practical benefit to one another as we serve one another in the fear of Christ. Ephesians 5.21 We were not saved to be spectators. Christ did not save us merely to gather in the same building once or twice a week to smile and to greet one another, to sing together, to listen to a sermon or a Bible study lesson, to pray, and then to retreat in seclusion to our own homes and our separate lives. It is a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance that we were saved to serve. Now, it's important to note that Paul is not calling us to a kind of asceticism 
where we don't pay any attention at all to our own personal interests. As one commentator put it, he's not prohibiting any interest in one's own affairs. It is the selfish preoccupation with them that he condemns. So Paul is not speaking here of a morbid self-denial, as if merely ignoring our own, in, our own interests and our own needs is a virtue. Just the ignorant, I don't, I don't care anything for myself. No, he's speaking rather of a large-heartedness that makes the interests of others our interests, that makes others' joy our joy. And it's because of that that I struggled to know what to call this principle of not merely looking out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Ultimately, I went with with helpfulness because I think it does a fairly good job of capturing the idea. And plus, it starts with H like humility does. But I wrestled with a number of other words. Some commentators call it self-forgetfulness. And I like that. I like self-forgetfulness. But but follow me here and think through this with me. Self-forgetfulness, okay, but Paul's emphasis isn't so much on going without good things yourself as much as it, is, as it is about gladly laying down your life to make sure that others have those good things. And then I thought about the word magnanimity. You know, this is a largeness of soul. It speaks of a large heartedness and em- embraces the good of others as one's own good. In other words, I don't just deny myself some good things and begrudgingly give those good things to you. Man, I really want this, but fine. No. I enlarge my heart to the point that I pursue your good as my good. I seek my joy in your joy. My happiness in your happiness. See, so I'm intimately involved there. Not this aloof, unaffected, stoic, here, you above me. No. I love you. I'd be happy to see you happy. I'd be happy to labor. It would be my joy to labor for your joy. That's the idea, the idea here. See, by virtue of the atoning work of Christ, we've been freed from our enslavement to only ever find our happiness and satisfaction in the exaltation of ourselves and the meeting of our own needs. Because God has opened our eyes to the glory of Christ, We are freed to find our joy in the magnification of somebody other than ourselves, of him. And in seeking to see him magnified, we lay down our lives so that others will come to honor and worship and treasure him and his glory as we have. And so as we lay down our lives in the faithful service to them, to others, to the saints, to the family of God, We do so in order to follow the command of the Lord Jesus to love our neighbor as ourselves. When we do that, we make much of him. We lift up his glory. We make him look attractive. A savior that can so satisfy a sinful human heart that they don't feel the need to go always be after their own interest, always be after their own personal things. But they are freed to actively, lovingly, genuinely, freely make the joy of others their joy. That makes Christ look great. And so that's the echo you should hear in Philippians 2.4. The second greatest commandment, to love your neighbor as yourselves. To not merely look out for your own interests, but to adopt the benefit and the well-being of your brothers and sisters as your interest. When you become aware of an opportunity to meet a need, let not your first thought be to your own family and your own education your own health, well-being, property, financial stability. All those things fit in that word interest. It's actually the word just things. It's very, very generic in the Greek, and it has the idea of just anything that can fit in, the affairs, the things, the interests of others. So family, health, property, financial stability, education. Don't let your mind go to, to yours, your things, your interests first. Be reminded that Christ has provided for you every need in the gospel and therefore has freed you to be able to intentionally consider how you might serve your brother's family, your brother's health, how you might prioritize your brother's property and financial stability and education and success above your own. See, if a church is filled with a people with that kind of heart, I'd be willing to wager that they would be intimately acquainted, familiar with 
true biblical Christian unity. Humility is the key to Christian unity. Disunity festers only so long as it's fed by selfishness, pride, and arrogance. But when the members of a congregation have a proper view of themselves in the light of God's holiness, all sense of entitlement, this sense that it is owed to me to be treated in a certain way, how dare she? All of that vanishes. Disunity simply cannot survive in a church that is permeated by the kind of gospel-driven humility that issues in a large-hearted, self-forgetful helpfulness that seeks its own happiness in the happiness of each other. Are you marked by this humility? Are you marked by this lowliness of mind? Are you marked by an honest, sober assessment of yourself, not thinking of yourself more highly than you ought? Do you genuinely regard others as more important than yourselves in the light of your own sinfulness and failures before our holy God? Or are there pockets of your character that are marked, yet marked, by selfish ambition and vainglory, empty conceit, that needs to be nailed to the cross of Christ by a yet unmortified, uncrucified lust for prominence, for recognition, and for vainglory that is willing to debase others if it means your own self-exaltation, that is envious and offended if honor is given to anyone else but you. In order to ensure that it's the former, before we close, I want to give you a few practical strategies for crucifying your pride and for cultivating the kind of gospel-driven humility that leads to true Christian unity. I've adapted these from C.J. Mahaney's book, Humility, which I mentioned before, and which I would highly recommend to you as you pursue your own pursuit of humility, efforts to mortify your pride. So number one, practical steps to crucifying pride and pursuing humility. Study the character of God. Study the character of God. The more acquainted you become with the beauty of the manifold perfections of our God, the better you will know yourself. When you regularly fill your mind with the absolute holiness of God, you'll become intimately aware of how far, how far you fall short of that holiness. And that apprehension, by God's grace, will bow you low. Very related to that, number two, Remember, you're always getting better than you deserve. You are always, in every situation, getting better than you deserve. So the reason we get offended when somebody else wrongs us is because we mistakenly believe that we deserve better. But the truth is we don't. In the light of our sin against this infinitely holy God, we, all of us, you and me, right now deserve to be suffering in hell experiencing the unbridled wrath of God against our sin. And none of us have it. None of us experience that by God's grace. So when someone else offends you, insults you, mistreats you, or is inconsiderate, I want you to talk to yourself. I want you to remind yourself, this is better than I deserve. I don't like it, but it's better than I deserve. And so I can bear it with grace. And I can count this person even better than myself. Number three, invite correction and rebuke. Invite correction and rebuke. This is so important. One of the clearest indicators of a prideful heart is an unteachable spirit. This overinflated view of self that can't receive correction without wearing the other person out first. You know, well, what do you mean? I mean, are you sure you did that? What did I do? Well, how did I say it? How are, you sure that that's, are you sure that's how I meant it? Can you read minds? Are you judging my heart? <laughs> Rather than foolishly despising reproof in that way, go out of your way to seek correction. Proverbs 12.1 puts it as plainly as you'll ever hear it. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. Proverbs 12.1, New American Standard, you check it. Don't be stupid. Invite the watchful, caring gaze of your brothers and sisters into your life. Invite it. And if others have the courage to bring something to your attention, 
Don't demand mathematical precision in order to benefit from their confrontation. Even if they don't have it 100% right, even if they're, if they're going about it the wrong way, this isn't about winning an argument. You're not out to vindicate yourself in their eyes. It's about discovering the sin in your life in whatever way you can discover it so that you can rightly see and know and worship Christ who will not be seen rightly and worshiped rightly if there is unconfessed and unrepented sin clouding your vision of him. So love correction. Seek it out. Invite it. Number four, Acknowledge dependence and transfer glory. Acknowledge dependence and transfer glory. At the beginning of every day, I want, you should come to God. This is a good practice. Come to God in prayer, which I'm sure and I trust that you do always. But acknowledge particularly your dependence on him for the day ahead of you. And not just for the day, but of course for your salvation, for your growth and grace, but even for the mundane things that lie ahead of you. Lord, I'm coming to you today and I acknowledge that without your grace, without your mercy, without your spirit, I can accomplish nothing. Vine and branches. It'll be a humbling reminder that you can't even get through the day on your own. And then at the end of the day, come to God in prayer and deflect all glory for any of the good things that happened to you in that day. Don't pat yourself on the back for the things that, that have happened to you that are good. Don't admire your accomplishments. Wow, that really worked out real well for me. I did a good job. If that thought's there, you say no, you push it down and you say, Lord, thank you for the grace that I've gotten to experience. Thank you for your precious gift to me that I got to experience a good gift. And I, and I give you all the glory for that. I want you to be honored and magnified for that. That comes from you and not from me. Systematically acknowledging that you have nothing that you haven't been given, 1 Corinthians 4, 7. And finally, number five, this is the most important one. Think much on the cross of Christ. Think much on the cross of Christ. And here I simply cannot improve upon the words of John Stott. Take this in. Let this arrive at home in your soul. John Stott writes, Every time we look at the cross, Christ seems to be saying to us, I am here because of you. It is your sin I am bearing. It is your curse I am suffering. It is your debt I am paying. Your death I am dying. Stott says, nothing in history or in the universe cuts us down to size like the cross. All of us have inflated views of ourselves, he says, especially in self-righteousness until we have visited a place called Calvary. It is there at the foot of the cross, that we shrink to our true size. Oh, dear friends, have you been cut down to size by this gospel, by this cross? Have you been bowed in horror by the ugliness of your own sin? Have you come to terms with the offense that your sin is to your creator, your master, and have you cried out to him in repentance for God to have mercy on your wretched state? Oh, if you haven't, if you haven't, I beg you to survey afresh this wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. To see that your sin is so heinous, your state is so helpless, that it took the only remedy was the brutal murder of the Son of God, the innocent Son of God, sinless, holy, harmless, undefiled. Nothing else could have been done but that. That's what your sin and my sin took, demanded. Confess your helplessness to commend yourself to God on the basis of your own righteousness and cast your hope for salvation on the righteousness of Christ alone. Wonder of wonders, he stands willing to receive you. Even this morning, he stands willing to receive you through repentance and faith in him. Would you come? And for my brothers and sisters who have been cut down to size by that gospel, let it continue to cut you down day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, so that it can be said, of the people 
in this place that Grace Community Church is a congregation marked by a gospel-driven humility. Pray that he'd accomplish that with me. Oh, Father, cause this to be true of us. Work in us by your Holy Spirit the grace of true Christ-like, God-honoring humility. Not a feigned self-deprecation, not a false modesty, but a true and honest assessment in the light of your holiness and our sinfulness. And cause us to be bowed low that you might exalt us in due time. Grant that we would know this humility, that we might know this unity, that, why, that we might be able to stand firm in the face of opposition, united in our mission to take the gospel to the world so that we might live lives worthy of that gospel. Lord Jesus, get what you are worthy of in your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to pastor and teacher Phil Johnson. For more information about the ministry of the Grace Life Pulpit, visit at www.thegracelifepulpit.com. Copyright by Phil Johnson, all rights reserved.